and welcome to The Light Gate. We are coming to you tonight from the beautiful city of New Orleans in Louisiana at the United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. We are on Roku, Facebook, and YouTube. We are shooting around the world and uh, not everybody gets to see us. A lot of you are hearing us only. So if we show film or anything that's visual, we will explain it to you and give you a really good description. Um, I'm so excited about this show this week. We have a wonderful author aboard with us with a very important case from uh, Australia. I'm excited. So I'm just going to kick it straight over to Preston. There you go. Ah, caught it. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly. Thank you all for joining us tonight on episode 48 of The Light Gate. Uh, pretty excited about today's guest. I, of course, am Preston Dennett, your host, my lovely co-host, is the irrepressible and very funny Dolly Saffron. <laughs> you are. You make me laugh. <laughs> and yeah, so excited to have you all joining us tonight for what promises to be a really amazing show. I've known about our guest for a while. I've seen him on a few other podcasts. The case he is going to be talking about tonight is a huge case. He's the go-to guy, and we'll get more into that in just a second. But first, I do want to say hi to you, all you guys in chat, because as I say each week, it's because of you we do this show. I consider you my friends, my family, really. Actually, I think I have an actual family member in chat tonight. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you guys mean a lot. So let me see. Who do we have here today? We have Brian Morgan, first in. Thank you so much. And Ken Trails, MN. Preston is the best. Oh, shucks. Thank you very much. So kind of you. Hello, Dawn. And we have Louise. Oh, okay. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> And I already said hello to Dawn, but there she is again. And namaste and his endless, unbelievable generosity. I've been a good boy, apparently, to deserve you. Thank you so much. Who else do we have here? Kayleen. You want to try and pronounce that last name, Do Dolly? <laughs> She's Gwyn Mither. Gwyn, Gwyn Mither. Yeah. All the way from <laughs> Australia. I love that name, by the way. I like it. Yes. Our guest is from Australia, so that's very cool. On Talks TV, all the way from Poland. Hello. Oh, <laughs> I'll never be able to remember that. I'll try. <laughs> Octopus with no friends. Thank you for oh. joining us. And here's my dear sweet sister-in-law and the artist for many of my books, including... This one, shameless plug, Humanoids and High Strangeness. Love that cover. Thank you, Christy. And of course, this one, which just came out, not from here, volume five, with the Anunnaki on the front. So thank you, Christy. Your artwork has pushed that book up on the bestseller list. I really think it's you. <laughs> um, okay, who else do we have here? Natasha Stone. Hello. And Oh, yeah, Kayleen remembers the Valentic case when it actually happened. That's awesome. Wow. Raul Melendez, so happy to be here. He says, excited about tonight's program. Yes, me too. And thanks so much for joining us. And thanks even more for your incredible generosity. You guys, it means a lot. This show does cost us a little bit to produce. And it helps a lot when we get these really wonderful generate donations. So thank mm -hmm. you so, so much. All right. Who else do we got going on here? Christine. Oops, I mispronounced Hello, your name. Sorry. Chris. Team. Team. <laughs> and we Dennis, love you. Dennis Whipple. Hello. And Finn and W. Decker and Phil. Emery. Hi, Preston. I hope you are both well. Great to catch you live. Mm -hmm. Bill from the UK. Wow. Awesome. Thanks for staying up. I know it's late there. I'm going to have to ask our guest what time it is in Australia because it's tomorrow I have morning or tomorrow morning. afternoon. Right <laughs> yeah. All right. Who else do we got? Kason Lee and Chris and 
Jacques and Octopus with no friends. I see Janice Connett. Hello. And Hello, Janice. James and follow the bear. Hey, Dolly. Kenny. Here. Hey, that's my godson. I love you. Oh, very cool. Hi, Kenny. Very cool. Chris. Teen says, you are such an awesome artist, Christine. <laughs> Two Christines. Rick Schatz, hello. I better get started or I'm going to get in trouble because Dolly doesn't want me to spend any more than five minutes doing this, and I just can't help it. There's so many of you walking trees. And Susan Alloway, yay. So glad to see you join us. Oh, gosh, Rick, thank you. That's so wow. unbelievably generous. Gosh, you guys, you. you just warm my heart. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But yes, let's get started with our show. Let me pull up the banner, and I'll give you a little bit of a clue. And let me find the bio and introduce our guest. Here it is. OK, tonight, our guest is author and researcher George Simpson. So we're very happy to have him here on the light gate. George was born in Melbourne, Australia, and has had a lifelong interest in the subject of UFOs since seeing one together with his sisters in 1967. Ooh, I think I want to start there. He read the book, UFOs, Where Do They Come From? by Richard Tambling in 1969 while in primary school. Wow, he got an early start on this subject. I'm a little jealous. He witnessed the initial part of the final flight of Frederick Valentik on October 21st, 1978 from his family home in Beaumarie. He became a member of VUFORS, the Victorian UFO Research Society in 1987, just after the Knowles case was reported in the news. For those of you who don't know, Faye Knowles and her three sons, I think it was, were driving down the some remote highway through the deserts of Australia when a UFO came down and basically lift, chased them down the highway and lifted up their car. Huge case. So yeah, he became a member of VUFORS in 1987, just after that case. He later, George, joined the VUFORS committee as a photographic consultant, listed as photographic officer in 1992 and served on that committee for the following eight years, then set up the Victorian branch of AUFORN, the Australian UFO Research Network, that was in the year 2000, ran investigations and followed up hundreds of sighting reports over the next 14 years. So he knows his subject. He's run four public meetings each year during that period as the director for the state of Victoria. During this period, he also wrote a regular column titled What's Next, which was followed by now, then, for the Ufologist magazine from 2000 until the magazine closed in February 2018. He's participated in the research, assistance, and filming of the first episode of the Science Channel production of Unexplained Files. That was in March 2013, which exam examined the Frederick Valentic mystery. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight the mysterious disappearance of Frederick Valentik during a UFO encounter, and George Simpson's book, Nothing on Radar, The Valentik Mystery, here it is, is the most comprehensive book on what has come to be one of Australia's most enduring and puzzling encounters. So we got a lot to talk about tonight. I'm super excited to have our guest, and let me just bring him on. Here he is, George. Thank you for joining Hi. us. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and an honor to be your guest. Uh, Preston, you've uh, written so many books on the subject. Uh, it, it's incredible how many books you turn out. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think when you love it, you know, it's not work. I don't know. I'm obsessed. I've got a problem. <laughs> oh, no. My wife says I don't have interests. I have obsessions. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I know the feelings. So, how are you yeah. doing today? Are yeah, you... pretty, pretty good. Yeah, it's a beautiful day here in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's just after. It's about twenty past midday here right now. 
All right. Wow. So uh, I have a day off work today, which is good. I get the occasional day off. It stops people from getting grumpy if they get a day off now and then. <laughs> so they understand that. You mentioned the book, Richard Tambling's book, um, Flying Sources. Where do they come from? Look, I still have a copy of it. Wow. Um, wow. I don't have uh, that one. I've got a lot of them, a, but I don't have that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rare book, but um, it's still out there in the bookshops, I guess. Very cool. Yeah. I'm going to have to check it out. It's the okay. first book I ever read, yeah, when I was in primary school. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> well, I'm excited to talk to you about the Valentic case and all the other research you've done in your own sighting. But mm -hmm. like I mentioned before the show, I like to ask the guests how they got involved in this field, what they were like as little kids. Were they? Did they believe in this? How did it all roll out for you? What brought you from a kid to this mm. path here, to this show, writing a book and all of your UFO research? It's a very interesting way to start, really, because, um, well, when I was in primary school and I was pretty young, um, there was a TV show on every week that everybody watched and, and talked about the next day. But that was The Outer Limits. Ah. Uh, yeah, and uh, there was like a different alien on TV every week, <laughs> or di a different monster or a different alien, or they called them bears. Um, but uh, the writers of the show said they had to have a bear in every episode, but it was an alien, some different type of alien. And um, they were very imaginative uh, to my mind when I was a kid, but... You look back at the shows now; they they've a, they haven't aged well. A lot of the storylines and things in the Outer Limits, but all the kids collected the uh, the bubble gum cards. You know, I've still got my set of fifty Outer Limits cards from <laughs> wow. the nineteen sixties. Probably worth something. <laughs> oh, I don't I don't know. But then we were growing up through the space race. You know, there was all of the um, the Gemini project. All these on TV, you'd see the astronauts floating around with a big cable connecting them, and they're just floating around in space. The first space walk, I remember that very clearly. Wow. Uh, then the Apollo missions came along, and of course they they landed on the moon. I was in uh, the sixth grade in primary school, and that was the year I read this book by Richard Tambling. And uh, <clears throat> I, children don't naturally they're not you're not born with a scientific mind. You're not born to um, critically evaluate everything. You just accept what you see, what's going on. Right. And I was quite surprised years later when there was so much heated discussion about whether or not flying <laughs> saucers were real. Um, people were seeing UFOs and reporting them, and a lot of people were saying, "Oh, that they're, they're, they're just imagining it." And I thought, "What's going on here?" You know. Um, <laughs> you you mentioned yeah that I was with my sisters who. We just walking down the street and we saw this very strange thing happen in front of us. Um, and uh, I, I can't say 100% um, what we saw was UFO, but it wasn't an aeroplane. Um, we, we saw what looked like two stars in the sky that weren't there the night before hmm. and they were sort of above our street and they separated from, they just parted like this. Mm -hmm. One one went south and then stopped and just remained there. The other one that went north, I watched it till it disappeared. It went around the over the horizon and it was silent. Don't know what it was, but it certainly fits the description of some kind of UFO activity, I guess. Right. Well, what were you, you thinking know? when you saw it? Were you, were you thinking UFO? <laughs> I don't think so, no, no. Um there was so many UFO cases that ended up getting into the news over the years that, that they started to uh, they started to make more sense, you know, especially when um, you have people uh, with good credibility reporting what they've seen um, and saying they don't have an explanation for what they just saw. So anyway, reading the first book I ever read about it, when I, we'd heard of flying sources just from science fiction, and when, when I saw this, this title, this book, um, Flying Sources, Where Do They Come From? I had to read it. It was in our, our school library. And reading this showed me that it was just one report after another, a whole collection of reports from all over Australia, from places I'd never heard of, 
in Australia mm -hmm. where people saw these things. And there's a few photographs in here in the book, a few classic UFO photos and things. Oh, Daniel Fry, people, I think that's... He, yes, that's right. <laughs> yep, yep. But also, um, I don't think there's any really uniquely Australian ones in here as far as photos go. Um, it's, it's amazing that's a, that was in your primary school library. There were no UFO books in mine. <laughs> well, it, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it, it just stood out. I had to read it. Um, and it, it's the first book I ever really read, you know. Um, and oh, it made, wow. an, made an impact on me because it kind of tuned me in. Whenever there was a news report of a UFO or something, then I'd, um, I'd, I'd take notice, you know, because... They do happen all around the world. Um, it's not just an American thing. It's all over the world. And uh, we've had a lot of cases here over the years in Australia. Um, <clears throat> there's, this is a sketch of one that was over <clears throat> near a suburb in Sydney. Oh, wow. It's like, um, like a ball with a series of balls around it. That's unusual. A, a place called uh, Wollstonecraft, which I hadn't even heard of. It's somewhere in Sydney. But yeah, a lot of very interesting cases uh, in that, and it just it just ignited my interest, and um, <clears throat> it just went on from there. So, whenever UFO cases came in the news, <clears throat> excuse me, I um I just took notice. You know, I couldn't not take notice, uh, and I, I wasn't trying to discredit them all. Like some people just dismiss everything they hear about. Um, especially people that are scientifically trained, they want evidence, they want hard evidence. You know, but most of them wouldn't believe that there was a an alien spacecraft unless it landed on their head. You know? Exactly. I remember the first time I ever heard of UFOs was the TV series In Search of. With oh, okay. Leonard yep. Nimoy, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just missed it. Yeah. I didn't believe it, not for a second. Yeah. And every now and then yeah. I'd hear it, but really it wasn't mm. until I was like, let's see, 21 years old when I heard a report uh -huh. on the news. Mm -hmm. Made me scratch my head because my brother, it turned out, had seen a UFO. Ah. You got a little bit of a head start on me <laughs> in terms of it hit me hard. I was not happy. But so I think yeah. probably it's easier if you grow up to it with it and know that you know there's something to this because I had no oh, idea. Cool. I could not believe it. there was a co cover up and all these cases. Right. right. So you started cool. just paying attention to it and how did it become something that. Yeah. You started to really well, get serious with it, it. It doesn't happen all at once, you know. One, one of my two sisters, who was with me when we had that strange sighting, told me years later that she'd had a sighting when she was a younger kid in primary school, the same school I went to. But um, before I started there, even she had this sighting, and um, <clears throat> she couldn't. Uh, she could, it was a very clear description of what she saw. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't clear my throat. This um. There was a cloud and there was um, what looked like um, something the size of a school bus, half of a school bus, sticking out of this cloud. It was a silver thing just sitting there. Hmm. And it just went back into the cloud and disappeared. Wow. That's and, more than um, just a light. That's amazing. There was a daylight disc sighting or maybe it was um, could have been a, um, a cigar-shaped object. I'm not sure. But she didn't tell me that till years later. <laughs> one, of, one of several sightings that she has had. Oh, wow. So That's kind it, of interesting. A, simply a lifelong interest. But if we want to um, move on to the, the the main story we want to talk about, yeah, maybe we should... Um, Let's go there. Well, <clears throat> where, where we lived, we had uh, we weren't very far from the nearest airport, just a domestic air. Air, not not an international airport, no big planes, just light planes. A place called Moorabbin, Moorabbin Airport. Um, there's a town near where we lived called Moorabbin, but the Moorabbin Airport's nowhere near Moorabbin. It's in a different location. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we weren't too far from the airport and we saw planes going over. I always like watching the planes fly past. And where we live here, we see planes all the time. Mainly light planes, aircraft, like Cessnas and Pipers and things like that flying around. But um, one day, 1978, so it's getting back now, it's 45 to 46 years ago mm, that wow. Fred disappeared. And um, just to give a very brief outline of the story, a young pilot 
hires a plane, wants to go down to a place called King Island um, and turn around and come back just to get some more flight hours up because he wants to become a commercial pilot. And um, the last thing he says is um, something's chasing him and bo bothering him, and then he and the plane vanished. That's a very short story. A lot of people have wanted to make movies or films about the case, but it's it's a very short story. Young man takes off on a plane, reports seeing something he cannot he cannot identify, then he disappears. So yeah, it's a very short story. But this this is a young man who, when he was a child, knew he wanted to be a pilot, right? He he, he had grown up with that idea. Well. Probably not all of his life, but his dad took him on a joy flight in an aeroplane at, at the same airport that he ended up training at, Moorabbin Airport. Okay. Um, it's considered, at the time, it was probably the busiest domestic airport in the Southern Hemisphere. That's the reputation it had anyway. We were seeing planes flying over all the time, you know. Um, I, I don't know, but he, his dad took him for a joy flight, and as soon as he'd been up in a plane... And had that experience, he decided, oh, I want to do this. I want to be a pilot. I want to do this for a living. Um, he joined oh. He joined the Australian Air Force Air Cadets to do his training. That, that photograph that I um, put on for you to show, that coloured photo of Frederick there, he's in his um, air cadet uniform in that photo. Oh, there we are. There we are. He's got the air cadet's uniform on. Um I'm not sure how, how old he was there, but he wanted his ambition was to get into the Air Force. Now, it's a very, very tough gig to just get into the Air Force. They only take the ducks of the school, you know, and Fred wasn't quite uh, at that level. Um, um, academically, he wasn't quite at the level to be to get into the He didn't quite get through the exams to join the Air Force. So he switched tactic and decide, well, I'll, I'll just become a, a pilot. I'll be a commercial pilot. I'll still be flying. He might not be flying around in fighter jets, but, you know, he wasn't a top, a top gun guy. But he was very good at flying the plane. Um, he's, he used to take his girlfriend up and he used to perform acrobatics with her on board. And <laughs> wow. it, it, it used to frighten her. He had very good command over the controls of the plane, for sure. He was... He was a very confident pilot. Um, a lot of people these days try to blame him for what happened, like it was, he somehow made this happen. But some people even say something which I just can't get my head around. They say, um, look, he had an interest in UFOs. And so it's funny how there's a UFO connection to this case where he disappeared or, or as if he sort of made it happen, you know, yeah. You can go outside and look for UFOs. You won't see anything <laughs> necessarily. So he you did know. have an interest in UFOs prior. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. well, if you if you're going to be flying up in the air, you want to you've got to have a good understanding of what you may encounter while you're in the air. That's I'd say that's common sense. Um, sure. Yeah. One of the uh, one of the trainers at the uh, the base that he was learning to fly at is at a place called Sail in Victoria, in southern Victoria. Um, there's an Air Force base down there. And he, um, one, of, one of his friends down there said that he was common sense on two legs. Oh, so, yeah. you know, he, no, um, he had common sense, but, but he just wasn't quite bright enough, I suppose, or uh, clever enough to get into the Air Force. It's very hard to get in. I don't think I'd be able to get into the Air Force, um, even with an extra, you know, 40, 60 years of ex life experience behind me. <laughs> I still wouldn't be able to get in, <laughs> you know. But anyway, he he was studying, he's doing, sitting for his exams to become a commercial pilot. And one of the things you do is you, you, you've got to generate more air hours, you've got to fly around and you've got to get more experience if, to get your qualifications. And this flight was just a routine flight. Um, no. Actually, it wasn't a cargo. A lot of the documentaries have said he was on a routine cargo flight. Well, he wasn't a commercial pilot and it wasn't a cargo flight. And there was nothing routine about it, according to other people who I know who are involved in aviation. 
one of the one of the last things you do is fly over the sea in a single engine plane alone. Right. right. Yeah, so a lot of people. Here's the airport, more. the Murabim Airport. I just oh, that's a that great. Out. That's a good aerial view of it. Yeah. There's all these buildings in the foreground. None of those were there back in 1978. They've all been built up in the recent 20, 25 years or so. That was all an area where planes could be parked or where you could do an emergency landing if you had to. Where right. I lived at the time was just over on the top, where all those houses are, the top right-hand side of that photo is right roughly here. where we lived. Hmm. So yeah. that's, that's, kind of an area, that's an area called Bo Morris. Um, that's where it was, Bo Morris. And, uh, and Fred went straight over where I was. Um, when that happened, it was 1978. Um, I was still at home with my parents. So I hadn't moved out of home yet. Um, and a friend was coming over and I just went out to just wait for this friend of mine to come along. And she was running a bit late and I saw the plane go by. Now, there was nothing unusual about seeing a Cessna fly past. We just went from the left to the right and was heading directly toward the setting sun from where I was, which is where Cape Otway is, which is he would have gone straight down over the Great Ocean Road, past all the surf beaches and right down to a place called Cape Otway where he would then turn to head down south to King Island. So... I just saw him going past and there was nothing unusual. However, something did happen when I was watching the plane. Now, I do write about this in the book and I just pass it off as, look, it was just a thought that entered my mind. But where this thought came from, I have no idea. Was it my subconscious or was it? did I receive a message from the other side? I don't know, but I clearly got this in, this instruction, keep your eyes on that plane or don't take your eyes off that plane. Hmm. That's wow. ha That happened to me. And I thought, yeah, that's odd. Where did that come from? But I watched the plane until it disappeared. It, it travelled until it disappeared behind the trees because it was going a lot further than I was on the ground level and it, it just, you know, things disappear over the horizon. The plane just continued on its way directly on a straight line across the bay from where I was, Port Phillip Bay. <clears throat> and um, so the next day there were news reports that I heard um, where they reported a plane has gone missing um, over Bass Strait and it, it was believed that it had run out of fuel and, and crashed in Bass Strait, which is a, the, the ocean between Victoria and Tasmania. It's quite a... Right. Quite a long distance here, that here ocean might be. Big... News reports. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the document you've got there on the left-hand side is actually the the uh, the, ac the missing aircraft accident report card that's been filled in there. And if you could zoom in on that, maybe you can't, but if you could zoom yeah. in on, on the one. I can. It, it'll have the, it should have the, the name of the owner of the aircraft. At the yes. top of that document, just at the top of that document. Oh, um, all right. Anyway, he was a we doctor. Cephas Day? Yep, Cephas Day. He was the doctor in the local area where I lived in Bomoris. He was one of the, he was a doctor. He had a, he had a practice in, um, he was a GP. He had a practice in uh, Reserve Road. And it different says on there, Reserve Road, Bomoris. Yep, 33 Reserve Road. Yep. Well, that house still exists. Um, it's just a private house now. It's no longer a doctor's surgery. Now, I didn't know that doctor. I never went to him, but a lot of my friends did. But years later, I found out his son is a friend of one of my neighbours, and I I, I've, I know he, this guy's son, and um, I used to take photographs of his Norton 850 Commando in my neighbour's front yard. So that's a strange little connection that I didn't know about until just a couple of years ago when I was oh. writing the book. Mm. Uh, the bottom of that is a bit of the transcript, I think, from yeah. the conversation. But anyway, um, that plane, 
why I had that thought, I, I really don't know, but it was definitely keep an eye on it. When I heard news reports the next day that the plane had gone missing, I thought, oh, I wonder if that's the same plane that I saw where I had that idea I should keep my eye on it. I wonder if that's connected. And, of course, it turns out from what I've been able to find out years later, it definitely was that aircraft. The one I saw was the same colour. Um, of course, as soon as I published the book, a new photograph appeared, which nobody had access to before. That's that colour photo of the of the plane on the grass, which I sent you. You could show that photo. Yeah. Not that one. That's Moravian Airport with Fred standing next to it. That's a good picture. Oh, okay. But Hold on. The one, of, the one of the aircraft in colour, just sitting on the grass, it's at Turidan Airport. It was the first one I sent you in there. There it room. is. Yep. Okay, let me pull that up. <clears throat> well, this photo has been just a private person's photograph. It's never been published at all. This photo was taken when the aircraft was brand new in 1968. Oh, and wow. that's the original the original paint job. You can see the registration number on the on the tail. Yep. Um, and that's at a place called Turidan, which um, is a local domestic airport, which would be probably, I'd say, 20 or 30 miles from where I live. Um, and what I didn't know, what I didn't realise, that's got black stripes down the side of the plane it's got blue it's white with a blue trim but black stripes but those black stripes have gold pinstriping it's a very nice looking yeah plane and it was brand new a really good little tidy little plane um and there's another unusual connection i have to the case which is that um a school friend of mine rented that aircraft two years before it vanished and, and took my sister and a few friends down to Tasmania one weekend. <laughs> and my sister borrowed my camera for that trip because she didn't have a camera of her own at the time. And um, so my my camera went down to Tasmania in that plane that then disappeared two years later. <laughs> wow. It's just crazy. <laughs> what are the chances? It, it's kind of crazy. And uh, and my neighbour, Bob, you know, he, his friend, Lionel, is the son of the guy who owned the aircraft. Wow. So, you know, it's it's kind of weird. I was circling kind around of, you this whole time. <laughs> kind of strange. Yeah. And then and I saw the plane on the day he disappeared on his way to his encounter with the unknown, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, I have to so, just back up for a second because, you know, you got that kind of a message. Have you had psychic stuff happen to you before? Premonitions or, you know, anything along those lines? <laughs> It's, oh, look, that's pretty unusual. It's very, very hard to say. Maybe sometimes when you're driving and you come around a bend, you think, oh, I better be careful here. And then there's somebody in your way, you know. Just, <laughs> that's, I think everybody has that sort of thing, you know. Sure. Um, but this this was very clear, you know, don't take your – keep your eyes on that plane or don't take your eyes off that plane. Yeah. Um, I really can't really explain it. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that, though. I've been watching a lot of videos about people who've had near-death experiences and they all talk about spirituality and the possibility of being able to be contacted from people that are no longer with us or things like that. I, I just don't know. The, the thing was, though, um, that's, if, if you thought for one minute it could there could be uh, say a higher being or a higher entity or somebody who can give you a warning perhaps some people believe they have um guardian angels and things like that right I, 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 my question would be well why didn't fred get a message of hey it's not a good day to go out today why don't you turn around and go back and land you know well that begs the question did anybody find the plane or him no nothing's been found and then you have to ask yourself another question it's not why but maybe he went with them maybe they picked him up and took yeah him. i'm just gonna ask you that's got to be one of the theories floating around um what that he was picked up yeah by et well um just before we get down to that position before we just keep that open for a minute <laughs> um what what i what i think is Fred might have got the same message I did. Hey, there's something 
dangerous or something not right and he might have ignored it and continued on because he had this he had he had an agenda which was to get those flight hours up so he could get his qualifications mm -hmm. so he could become he wanted to be a pilot a commercial pilot he may have got a warning and ignored it that's the only thing i can really reconcile myself with so he um, wasn't on a doing he wasn't carrying anything special in the plane or anything like that this, Along... he had he had a um like an an empty ice box you know a portable ice box we, we call it an esky in australia there's a brand name this one that was like a picnic basket ice box thing um the story was that he was going to get some um lobsters which you, you call them lobsters we call them crayfish same right. same thing right. they had um you could he, where that photo on the book was taken was a place called crayfish bay which is right near cape otway um he was but there's a lot of fishing going on down at king island and he the theory was that he was going to pick up some of these crayfish and bring them back that was his mission and there was going to be an officer's party that night so he was getting the fresh crayfish for that trip well he did have a, a few extra life jackets in the back of the plane hmm. that that was to conceal the ice box because the people who rent planes out don't like you carrying seafood in the aircraft because the plane ends up smelling like a fish a fish shop <laughs> <laughs> and right. so they they're trying to rent it out to people they don't want it to smell like a fish shop so he did have extra and now, then people said well he was going to pick up some people for, at king island and bring them back but he, he did, didn't have any arrangement necessarily to even land on the island you'd have to to pick up the crayfish but um one of the gentlemen who the guy who who had the job of turning on the landing strip lights at king island um he his name was brian jones and i've met him and spoken to him he said that there was um there was no instruction that he got to turn the landing lights on he said that there were no he checked and there were no there was no um all, all the crayfish had sold out earlier that day like by by lunchtime all the crayfish had been sold and fred was going down there in the evening so he couldn't have been collecting crayfish because they were all that they'd been sold out that day he may have had an arrangement to meet someone and pick it up he might have prepaid for it and it was just waiting for him that's a possibility but um he wasn't picking up any passengers for sure but there was an esky in the back the ice box thing was in the back of the plane um, right. but that's a, a side story really that the main issue is he was flying along was it dark and, um, messy was it dark yes was when he was flying well when i saw him go past he was up in the sunshine i was in the shade of all the trees the sun was very low and he was in the sunshine but he took about three quarters of an hour to get from where i saw him to cape otway it's about a three quarters of an hour flight right. it's about a four and a, four and a half or five hour drive to get down there so you get down there pretty quick in an airplane um, but he got down to Cape Otway right on 7 p.m. Now, we're, we're pretty low in, in, in Victoria. We're geographically pretty pretty low degrees-wise, you know, from the, from the equator. We're pretty low down, about 32 degrees south. And so by October, you have a very long twilight period because of our southern location you get a long twilight before it gets dark if you live in sydney um the opposite happens it's daytime oh, the sun goes down bang it's dark almost straight away it's ridiculous i've i've noticed that whenever i've gone to sydney and stayed yeah. there one moment is daytime next minute bang it's it's black it's dark that doesn't happen down here down here you do get a twilight period especially that time of year in October this is late October so we're we're heading towards summer mm -hmm. and uh, you get that long twilight zone period so Fred literally flew into the twilight zone he, oh, well. he definitely did I have a question oh. I'm, I'm thinking about something I'm Jesus curious pathway by the way so yeah are wondering pathway 
Yeah. One of the things I'm curious about is uh, I grew up in the Everglades in Miami and I have people in my family who were pilots and I was yep. crazy for flying. And um, I also had shortwave radio and I yep. knew what frequencies to go to to listen to the flights going over my head. And I just turned the thing on in the daytime and just listened to it while I was walking yep. around. Yep. And um, we had a very bad crash of an aircraft in the blades. We mm -hmm. felt it when it happened. And I immediately went to the emergency channel to listen to the chatter about what was going on. And we realized right. what was going on. Um, did anybody, did it, was there people like that where you were, like who would listen to radio transmissions? Did anybody else beside the tower hear him at all? There was a lot of people in the room where the air traffic advisor was speaking to him. Yeah. who were listening to the conversation as it was happening, um, Some of which, one of which contacted the radar operator on the same, in the same airport and, and tried to get radar information. Um, and the reply that came back was that there was, they couldn't see anything on radar in that area. And that's why I titled the book Nothing on Radar because they checked at the time while the conversation was happening and there was nothing coming back on radar. So he yeah. actually said there, there's a couple position. of... Hmm? Did they ask him for position? When you, when you call an emergency, they want to know where you are. Did they ask him what's your position? Well, the when they called the radar guy, they said, we've got this guy down at Cape Otway. So they located where he was. Right. They said, is that like... Because he reached Cape Otway and he reported... Um, DSJ Melbourne, I'm at Cape Otway, now proceeding to King Island. So they knew exactly where he was at 7 p.m. Six minutes later, he called in and said, um, is there any aircraft below 5,000? And they said, no, no, no aircraft. And he said, well, I, I have, seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Hmm. So then they asked him to describe it. Um, so they knew where he was. But they didn't have any radar returns. The the radar operator said, I've got a couple of returns from a bit further north than that, but nothing that I would say was an aircraft. Okay. So there was nothing nothing coming back on radar from where he was. By the time he was asking about what is do you have any aircraft flying around where I am, was his question. Um they reported, no, there's no aircraft in your vicinity, there's nothing there. Um, and then he started to describe it. So by that time, he was about a third of the way to King Island from the mainland. It's about okay. a half-hour flight from Cape Otway to King Island. That's about a half an hour stretch. Um, and he was about a third of the way when he began talking to them. The conversation went for about seven, seven and a half minutes, and then it was abruptly finished. And I believe at that point there was an aircraft collision. I think they, the two collided. Uh, and that would explain why nothing, the plane didn't actually hit the ground or didn't hit the, the, the sea at all, I don't believe. But that's based on a report that came in from a farmer in another district who claimed to see a, a large 30, what was it, 30, uh, a 90 feet diameter, 30 metre, 30, a 30 yard diameter. 90 foot diameter object hovering above him the next day that's wow. in part two the second part of my book the most of the cases most of the people that cover this case never get to part two they don't even yeah. look at part two uh which is quite intriguing which we can talk about uh, uh later on but he he tried to describe this thing flying around him um he very clearly tried to describe, he said it looked like four bright landing lights. Um, and he, he asked several times if there was any military aircraft in the area because this thing was acting like a fighter jet going very fast, coming and going very quickly, and he couldn't understand. It was so fast he couldn't get a good look at it. He said, I cannot, he said, I cannot affirm it, it gets such speed. So it was going so quickly he couldn't even describe what he was seeing. Yeah, Very Cessna, clearly. you don't you've got a wing over your cockpit. So it's hard to, you know, unless they're right in front of you and you've got yeah. the you know, the windows that you can look out of, you can't look straight up in a Cessna at all. And so no. if they came over him, he couldn't follow it at all. No, wow. no, no. He, he he actually began at that point to um 
what they call orbit. He started orbiting, yeah. just going around in a large circle wow. so that he wasn't going to go off track where he was headed to, but he wasn't going to change his location generally, but he could look around for a while and see what, what's going on here. Wow. At, at one point he said, it seems to be playing some sort of a game. So, so this yeah. thing was coming in. Yeah. This, this wasn't, I mean, this clearly wasn't a accidental thing. If it's circling around him and he's circling around it. I, I think it, it, it ended up becoming an accidental collision at the end. But before that, this thing was coming and going. At one point he said, um, it's just vanished. And wow. then Steve, Steve Roby says, oh, the, he also said, um, it's just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. And he was at four and a half thousand. So then he said it's vanished. And then later he said, oh, it's, it's now, when he was asked to confirm that it was vanished, he said, oh, it's now approaching from a certain direction. So he had to work out his direction because he'd been going around in a circle for a little while. Oh, wow. And he, he had to get his bearings from his compass and work out where he was so he could answer the question, right. where is it coming from? But it, it went, it disappeared and it came back. Um, this thing was darting around very, very quickly. Um, and I when would he call says that it, conventional aircraft of any kind, you know? <laughs> well, well, one one thing he says, I'll, I'll, I'll just go to his trans, the transcript, which is in the back of my book, yeah. by the way. Um, there's one part that really shows that he had trouble describing the thing. And... He says that it's. He's asked. He asks again. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the area? Um, Here's a picture of him next to the plane, right? Yep, yep. That's at Moorabbin Airport. Now, he said, Delta Sierra Juliet Melbourne. It seems like it's chasing me. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me also. It's got a green light and sort of metallic-like. It's all shiny on the outside. Wow. Um, and then he says it's just vanished. Um, and then Melbourne asks him what kind of aircraft um, is it. He says, he asks Melbourne, would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is there certain military aircraft? So he's trying to work out what it is, and he just has no idea what it is. Then they say... Um, they say, can you confirm it vanished? He says, say again. Um, and then they say, is the aircraft still with you? And he says, that's nor approaching from the southwest. So he's got his bearings back. But then he says, my engine is up, is rough idling. I've got it set at 23, 24, and the thing is coughing. Uh -oh. Now, that, that's kind of an engine trouble warning coming through. And Steve gets straight onto that. Steve Roby, the air traffic advisor, uh, he's a fully qualified air traffic controller. In this case, he was only an advisor because Fred was flying in an uncontrolled airspace. That's just how it, how it goes. He could only ad advise him. Um, so, so Steve asked him, well, what are your intentions? Because he's reporting these engines coughing. And I think Fred misunderstood the question. He just said, oh, my intentions are to go to King Island. That was his flight plan. That's what everybody knew. And But then Fred says, um, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Wow. And so then, then Steve answers, Delta Sierra Juliet, and then Fred tries to give him another message and gets interrupted mid-sentence. He says, uh, Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, and then this funny noise starts. And that noise has been published. You might yeah. have heard it. That strange metallic sound started right there. And How long interrupted. Did that goes for about 17 seconds Yeah. And, and then stops. And what's interesting about that, there's so much hidden information in there that he must have had his hand on the microphone for that sound to even get transmitted. That's right. And he stopped talking. I, I believe that at that point when that noise started, I think the aircraft has become somehow connected to the side of this flying object and the prop is still going at 2300 RPM or what, what was it, 20, 
2300 rpm and it's cutting into the side of the thing and chop 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 into the side of this object that is now sort of attached or stuck to and all that's based on this farmer's report from the next day that he saw this thing hovering over his farm and there was an airplane stuck to the outside of it and it flew away with the airplane still attached and he could read the registration number Holy on the smokes. wing of the plane yeah this is from the next day this is this is the, the chapter in the book called um lorry it's about this guy called lorry Ryder who was interviewed who recounted the story of this farmer um i've done a lot of research to try to find out who the farmer was because the name wasn't mentioned on this interview tape and i was able to make a bit of headway after a, a long time but that gets even weirder but that's beyond the scope of our discussion i think really but the thing is fred there was there's no evidence that uh that the, any aircraft ever hit the water there was no wreckage ever washed up of fred's plane um and the last thing he said was that strange object is hovering above me it's not an aircraft and he and the plane vanished so it's a great mystery um how many Air Force bases are near that area, military bases? Oh, where that happened, it's, it's out over the sea, over the ocean. There's no military air bases around there. Um, military aircraft would be a heck of a long way from base to be at halfway between Tasmania and Victoria. I assume they, there was a, a search for the aircraft as well, right? Yeah, it lasted for about six days. Um, they found um, a bit of oil, a bit of an oil slick. They got a sample, and it took them about three weeks to analyse that oil sample in those days. Marine diesel. Oh. So, All right. so no harm. It won't be anything to do with an aircraft, no. no. If the oh. aircraft hit the water, it would have broken up. Pieces would right. have broken off. Pieces float. Things get washed yeah. up. Nothing got washed up. Right. Nothing was ever washed up. About five years later, a piece of a Cessna air intake manifold was found 390 kilometres away from Fred's last known position. I've measured it on a map. Did that have a serial number? Yeah, it didn't match. No. Okay. But the, skept the skeptics jumped on that and said, oh, that's it. See, he's gone down in the sea. Well, these little aircraft, um, Cessna air intake manifold cowlings are only held on by a couple of pop rivets. They come free. They come. They fall off. They fall out of the sky. Quite, they're quite regularly found missing when the mechanics do the yeah. aircraft maintenance. And where this one was found was over near Flinders Island, which is hundreds of kilometres away from where Fred was, and it was very near an airport landing strip on that island. Okay. I think it came from a different aircraft. And the, the numbers were similar, similar series, but they didn't, it wasn't a match. Okay. Hmm. So I go into that in the book as well, so in quite a bit of detail. So, yeah, it's an amazing mystery. Um we can talk about this farmer's sighting the next morning, if you like. Um, yes. Yeah, well, well, first, let's take a quick station ID break because this is Absolutely. a good, good transition point. We're about here at the top of the hour. So I want to let you all know that you are watching The Light Gate, episode 48. I'm your host, Preston Dennett. My lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. Tonight, we're talking to George Simpson, author of the book, Nothing on radar and the Frederick it. Valentic disappearance. Is that right? I got that right? Uh, yeah. Frederick Valentich. It's a chip. Valentich. Okay. Yes, that's it. You got it. You got it. I've been mispronouncing Valentich. the whole time. <laughs> all right. And uh, yeah, we've talked about all how uh, George had got involved in the UFO field with mm -hmm. an early sighting as a kid and how he read a UFO book in primary school some of his family sightings and his mm -hmm. pathway to finding out more about UFOs and his really interesting connections to the case itself. Mm -hmm. And of course, we heard the transcripts and the whole story of how all of this occurred. So quite interesting and definitely check out the book if you want more info. We've still got a lot to talk about. 
But I do want to let you know that we are streaming live on United Public Radio Network at 107.7 and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3. Those are both FM streaming live from the beautiful city of New Orleans in Louisiana. We, of course, are also on a number of other platforms, including Roku and YouTube and Facebook. And that's it for now. Let's get back to our amazing discussion. Hoping to hear about some of your investigations, too. And you kind of intrigued me when you said, talked about that farmer and say there's some weird stuff going on with that. It's a little beyond the scope of our conversation, but gosh, we've got time. So, <laughs> which, which, which part are you talking about? Um, with this, like, like the farmer. Yeah. The farmer. Oh, well, well, okay. It's really the, there's a chapter in the book called Laurie. It's about a guy called Laurie Ryder. And he ran a hardware store in central northern New South Wales. He ran that for many years. He just had this, there was a lot of UFO sightings from the area that he was in, which is a town called Coonabarabran. It's a bit All of a right. mouthful. Coonabarabran. <laughs> Now, this area, um, they had a lot of UFO sightings. There's a lot of rate, a lot of telescopes up there. There's a bit of a mountain and a lot of telescopes up there. And a lot of people say it's a very strange area, a strange place. There's a lot of sightings that happen around Coonabarabran in New South Wales. Now, a good friend of mine, Bill Chalker, um, ah. went there to investigate and speak to all of these witnesses about UFOs. And most of them said, you've got to go talk to Laurie. You got to go talk to Laurie. And Laurie ran, ran the local hardware store. Now Laurie loved these UFO stories that people would say. He'd always ask his customers, "Have you ever seen anything unusual or strange?" And if it was a UFO story, he'd write it down. He would document it in a journal. So he was keeping all these UFO reports in journals. Now, unfortunately, when he died, his children took all the journals and burned them. Oh no! Yeah. Everything That's was tragic. lost. But hmm. Bill Chalker visited him. He was still around and he was, he, Bill went to his place and did a tape recording and recorded him and asked him about all these sightings that had happened. And Laurie said on the recording, now I've got a copy of the entire audio recording where Laurie basically says, look, there was a real mixed bag of these UFO cases over the years. He's got a lot of them. He said, but by far the most interesting one of the lot was a farmer who came into my shop one day. He said he got off this little ag bike. He said it was like a little sewing machine, you know, those little little, little tiny motorbikes. He right. said that he came into the shop and he came to buy something and I asked him, have you ever had any unusual experience? Well, this farmer had moved up there from near Adelaide, a place called Murray Bridge, in South Australia, when he was down there, which was the day after Fred went missing in Victoria, he was harvesting lucerne on his property with a harvesting machine for crop feed. And he had heard this very strange whining sound. He thought his equipment had broken down mm -hmm. and it's driven by the tractor's engine. So he uncoupled it and then he was going to check it and see if there's anything broken out the back. And he couldn't work it out because the sound continued even though he disconnected it. <laughs> and then he looked up and there was this thing hovering above him. That's where the sound was coming from. And it was, he said, it was 90 feet in diameter. So whew, 30 yards, 30 metres, whatever, a large object hovering above him. And he, it, a lot of farmers in his area do their own crop dusting. So there a lot of them are pilots and they have aviation um, knowledge. They understand that our understanding of aviation is you have to have a you have to maintain airspeed or you stall and you're going to fall. This right. thing wasn't going fast enough. It was going to his mind slower than stalling speed and he was under it. He thought this <laughs> thing's going to come down. <laughs> well, it, it didn't come down, but he, just to be sure, um, general intelligence, instinct to survive, took over. He ran 
away from his tractor. He ran to the side to get clear of the edge of this thing in case it came down, right? Survival instinct. Yeah. Probably so from the start. side, from, from the side, he's looking up at this thing in the air. Um, there is a photograph. I made up a mock photo to illustrate what he might have seen, and that's in the book, Nothing on Radar. Um, there's this disc there, and he's watching it, and it's just sitting there, not going fast enough to remain up there, according to his mind, mm -hmm. and it's slowly rotating. And what comes into view? It looks like a cross on the side, a white cross. It's the Cessna oh stuck my. to the side, to the outer edge of this thing, the That's whole plane. Insane. This is on the tape. You can hear him saying it. It's, be, it's actually on, it's on YouTube, um, Laurie Ryder talking about this. And he says the thing was backed up like the wings were stuck to the side, the tail hanging down, the engine up high, the wheels would have been sticking towards him. And you could see the engine, you could see the aircraft registration number on the wing. So he scratched it into his tractor with a nail so he wouldn't forget the number. Now, when oh. Laurie was when Laurie was telling Bill this, he couldn't remember what the number was. He said, I've got it written down in a book somewhere back at my shop, and I'll get the number and I'll give it to you. It's the same number, it's VHDSJ, Delta Sierra Juliet, the plane that missed went missing the evening before. This is the next morning, but this is not in Victoria. This is in South Australia. Hmm. And, How far away is that? Uh, it's about an eight-hour drive. You know, it's 500 hmm. miles, 800 kilometres, 500 miles, and it's the next morning. Now, I've got a report from another person who was just a kid living in Adelaide at the time. He got woken up one morning and his dad could, could only tell me it was October 1978. That's These kids were only about five or six years old. The two brothers got woken up in the middle of the night by this strange noise. And they looked out their window and there was this, this object that was so big, it was over their house roof, but over the roof of the house across the road as well, this big circular thing. <laughs> yeah. wow. And it had, had lights on it and it's in the same time frame and it was a funny noise. Now, it could be the same one we don't know. But they didn't see any airplanes stuck on the outside. It was night time. But the farmer saw the plane and scratched the number into his tractor. I want to find the tractor with that registration. Oh, that okay. so, yeah. into that would be really interesting. To know. And, and really then the, yeah. uh, there was a big drought in the area and the, the farmer found it hard to make a living and he moved to New South Wales. They have a better rainfall than New South Wales. And that's when he told, that's where the story came from, the guy in the hardware store wow. who re recounted the message to Bill Chalker. So it's a bit of a long, long bow to draw, but it's a very interesting story. It would it would uh, account for nothing being found in the sea, nothing getting washed up if it flew away, stuck to the side of a flying saucer, a big it, one. Then they were going to drop it off and he saw them and they decided not to because they try to do that when nobody else is around. They'll leave it's it. Even the crap. story get the story gets really weird. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the the farmer um, said that it, tra it traveled over to an area where there were some military maneuvers happening that day, that weekend. There was a mil there's a military base, an army base not far from. It's actually part of. It's in the Murray Bridge area. Now I've got a a UFO researcher friend you might have heard of, another fellow, his name's John Ocatell, and he has army connections. I asked him to look into this, and he confirmed there was an army exercise at Murray Bridge on that date, the day, mm -hmm. the day after Fred, dis, Fred went missing. So Laurie was telling us the truth, or well, the farmer told him the truth, and Laurie just recalled the truth, and it's on the record, it's on the tape, and anyone can hear the tape. He says... It, it disappeared over to where the military manoeuvres were. It's hard to hear what he says with his accent, but um, and he talks pretty quickly, but it went over to the army base, and I've been past that army base. Now, there were, there were guys out there running around, shooting at each other, practising, doing exercises or target practice or something. They may have seen something fly over. 
but there's never been any reports come out of there. Nobody's ever reported mm -hmm. this yeah. from there. But um, the young kids that saw this thing in Modbury Heights in Adelaide um, who got woken up by this funny noise, the farmer was alerted by the funny noise, this strange noise, because I think that the, the prop had damaged that flying disc somehow and it was making a funny noise as a result. Wow. Uh, I, I have three questions, okay? My brain's working hard. You <laughs> saw the plane on the side of that craft, and the, and the nose was up. Was the prop on the nose, and did you yeah. notice if it had any damage to it anywhere, like impact damage? To what, the plane? Yes. Well, the, you couldn't tell because it was backed up on the side of this thing, you see. It was okay. just... All you could see probably wasn't damaged. He did say that there was oil running down the side of the aircraft. See, the, the propellers have a pitch control, which is right. hydraulic, and if the propeller's been chopping into the side of this metallic thing, it could have very well damaged the prop, uh, and there would be oil going everywhere, and that's at the top. So the oil would have been running right. down. The farmer said there was oil. He also said the farmer said he couldn't see any ropes or any chains or anything. He couldn't work out why it was stuck there it could be that there was a big field magnet of some kind if it was a gravitational right. propulsion craft the, yeah. the engine the engine's the only part of a cessna that's actually a uh, ferrous material right that could be attracted by a magnet the rest of the plane wouldn't be because it's all aluminium yeah. yeah well um, now you're making me think this is human built uh craft not et because et would have repelled this plane it never would have crashed into it they have a field around them that would have repelled it immediately. He would have crashed into the ocean or he would have hit the ground if, if he had come in contact with a ET craft. And uh, if he'd hit a military one that's back engineered, so to speak. Well, that, that's that's interesting. That It's interesting that you say that because um, you guys would have heard of a guy called Gordon Liddy, wouldn't you? G. Gordon Liddy. G. Yes. Gordon Liddy. You'd know who yes. he was, that he was involved in – the Watergate, he was one of the guys who broke in Yes. Um, to Watergate and all that. He came out to Australia in the early 1980s Yeah. and went on a TV program. I know I, I talk about this in the book, but I didn't say who he was because he was still alive at the time when I published. Okay. And I don't want to get sued. I don't want to get sued. Right. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> sure. Yeah, understand. Understandable. But he, he came out here and he went on a TV program called The Don Lane Show. Don Lane was an American who moved to Australia and had a Tonight Show, mm. based like the Johnny Carson Show, but in Melbourne, in, in Australia. And he had this, Gordon Liddy came on his show. And to generate a lot of interest in the show, um, he said that he needed, he demanded an armed escort from his hotel for him and his wife to go into the TV channel, to go on TV live and tell us something about the Valentich case. And mm -hmm. then he wanted an armed escort back to the, to the airport. He was getting on a plane and leaving the country because he feared for his life because yeah. what he was going to tell us was so interesting and so important and we had a right to know about it. This well, that means that it convinces okay. me even more. Yeah. I'm in suspense. Yeah. Right. Now, when he went on TV, he said that the what happened to Frederick it had nothing to do with uh, aliens or a UFO. Right. He said it came from Pine Gap, which is an American base in Ooh. central northern yes. Australia, oh, northern yes. territory. Right. We've got a question about that in chat, which I'll pop yeah. up later. Yeah. He he said they we have us uh, we Americans we have these drones that look like flying saucers they're a circular craft we have big ones and little ones they're electrogravitic by nature we can take them anywhere and do surveillance anytime we like anywhere we, and we probably won't even be detected if anyone reports us they're not going to believe the reports because nobody believes in flying saucers so these things have immunity uh, impunity they can go anywhere he said one day the big one came back with an aeroplane stuck to the side of it and the pilot was still inside it and he was okay. He's now part of our program and he's not allowed to talk. He's not allowed to have anything oh to do God. with, with the, he's yeah. not allowed to contact his family or anything because oh he's now goodness. part of the top secrets you know, top, and it had nothing to do with aliens. I think that was all made, a CIA story that was made up so that Australians wouldn't think that Fred disappeared 
after encountering um, an alien spacecraft. That's what I think. <laughs> wow. I think, no, I think it was a, a CIA story. Yeah. But that, that was on Channel 9. Now, one of, the, one of the producers of that program confirmed to me that it was Gordon Liddy. And I, it took me a long time to find out who it was. As soon yeah. as I heard it was Gordon Liddy, I, I thought, tell you okay. from my experience flying, I know uh, how craft work. ET craft, and there's no way it would have crashed into an ET craft, and it wouldn't, they would never, I mean, it just never would have happened. They would not have played with it like that either. They would not have caused this young man to crash on purpose unless they were going to lift him off. Okay. So, yeah, but then, why would the government do something like that? that because, be, uh, do you really want my opinion on it? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to say it out loud. Just put it this way there are, Entities within entities within entities in the military, and nobody tells anybody anything. And yeah. this can happen oh. here, and one person knows what it's right about it or wrong about it, and then everybody else is totally clueless. They don't have a mm. chain of command like you think they would in instances like this. Mm. And if it was a drone, it was probably either manned or unmanned. If it was unmanned, nobody got hurt, and they brought this kid back to the base. Sure, yeah. they would have taken him in. It would have been a my lab, instantaneous my lab on this yeah. project. So, and, well, look, we can only speculate, can't we? Because we, we don't know. Yeah. Levels and levels but to it, this. But it is very, very interesting, though, that uh, that this farmer described this happening. Yeah. Um, he said that he went into town later that day after seeing the thing fly away with the plane stuck on the side. He wow. went into town and a neighbour came up to him and said, I, th I see you're doing some more crop spreading. He said, no, why do, you, why do you say that? He said, well, what's the Cessna doing in your top paddock? Hmm. And he said, "He said, I, there's no Cessna in my top paddock, mate. He said, yes, there is. I was down there this morning and I saw it down there. He said, well, that's yeah. interesting. So when I, I go home, I'll have a look, you know. And he, he went up to where his airstrip was at the end of his property. Yeah. And he said there was uh, tyre marks in the grass and a, a pool of sump oil at the end of the tyre marks but there was no sign of any aircraft, but something yeah. had been there. Wow. That was um, later yeah. in the day. So it, it's a very strange end to a very unusual story. <laughs> um, incredible. Maybe someday if, if he is alive and he's being held or whatever, maybe someday he'll get away from him and come out. You never know. I hope so. So I well, want to I, I bring up a photograph before we get too far along, which you sent, which I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. is, is this related to the case in some way? Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is um, this photograph was is on the cover of the book. This photo was taken by a fellow who was on holiday down there, a guy called Roy Manifold. He was on holiday. This is Crayfish Bay, this beach, and it's very close to Cape Otway, and it was taken about 15 to 20 minutes before Fred flew into this area in the photo. Hmm. Now, if you zoom in on that strange blob in the sky, yeah. have a good look at that. Um, tell me what it is. I'd like to know. Look, how would you even describe that if it was flying around you in the sky? What is that? Yeah. yeah well, hard. sometimes cumulus nimbus clouds will pop up like that. They'll just be one little blob of... That's not a cloud. I know, but, you know, it could be. It's a grainy photograph. You can't totally tell. Mm. But well, it, it has a form on the bottom of it that's interesting as heck. That would be a type of drone in that picture. You know? Well, there's a big cloud of blue sparkly dots Oops. next to right. it on, the, on yep. its left-hand side. Yep. Which is some kind of energy field or something, people have said. Scientists have said it's, it looks like an energy field around it. Um, which they can't explain. What One part of the transcript we didn't get to, um, where Fred described this thing, um, I'll just get to this part from the transcript. Yeah, this is, this is where he's describing that object that you just looked at. He says, he says, he seems to be playing some sort of game He's flying over me two, three times at a time at speeds I could not identify. Hmm. All right. So how, how, that's 
Yeah. How can something fly over you two, three times at a time at speeds you cannot identify? I don't know of any uh, man-made craft that can fly around like that, that can do those sort of maneuvers. He's going counterclockwise to him. Uh, it can seem faster than it really is. Perspective is everything when you're flying, you know that. And uh, yeah. it, it, and he's looking up and he's under stress, you know, and yeah, it can appear that way. Uh, those <laughs> drones, those military drones that I know about, can go up to two thousand miles an hour, they, and they don't break the sound barrier when they do, and it kind of freaks mm -hmm. me out. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know. There's what a lot made of behind the scenes that we just don't know what's going on on this. What, what are they made of? Yeah. So here what is it? Good question. Photograph. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the memorial? Yeah. Well, that's Steve oh. Roby. There's a whole chapter about the memorial in the book because that memorial disappeared for a while. Um, we thought it had been stolen, but actually the family took it in to do some maintenance to upgrade it because All it was right. sad okay. in the weather there, sad in a lot of weather. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the family haven't been able to, it's an open case still. They haven't been able to have a funeral service. There's been no closure for the family. Oh, my goodness. In, 46 years so that, he's not that, been declared dead he's still missing he's yes. still missing no he's there's no body being found they can't have a funeral without a body um there's no wreckage found how old was um, he by the way he was pretty young he was man. 40. So he, he and i were born in the same year he was two months older than me he was 20. he was oh, just wow. a kid and all these people that say, oh, he was a bad pilot, you know, he'd made a few aviation mistakes. Well, then everybody does that when they're learning, right. you know. He he um, flew into cloud and got reprimanded for flying into cloud at one stage. I mean, gee, the clouds are up there. How can you not fly into cloud when you're flying a plane? It's right. ridiculous. Exactly. So his, um, his father, did you ever get a chance to talk to I, I got Guido. to know Guido really well because Guido used to come to the UFO meetings and he was still looking for answers. Um, unfortunately, he died in early 2000. He never got any answers. Uh, his wife is still alive. I, I speak to her sometimes, um, Alberta. Um, I've met Fred's younger brother a few times. We were on a documentary together. I've met one of his sisters as well. Um it's a very strange thing. Fred's birthday and his twin sisters um, and his mother all have their birthdays on the same day. Wow. That's kind of weird. <laughs> but anyway, um, they, um, they're they really nice people and they've always been just looking for answers and they've never had any answers. Yeah, there's uh, a weird kind uh, of uh, similarity to the, what's it, Felix Monkla who disappeared over... Lake Superior after being vectored to a UFO. Mm -hmm. um, it's another possibility where someone was, you know, because they never found that plane either. Yeah, right. And there's quite a few cases actually from throughout the 1950s. There was a number of them. Uh, where where would you hide a Cessna? I'd hide a, if I wanted to hide a Cessna, I'd put it on the, the other side of the moon, wouldn't you? <laughs> on, on, on the far side. Gosh, That's I hope. Where I'd put it. <laughs> One day we're going to go to the moon, and there they'll all be. That, that that photograph you showed of the plaque with the man standing there—that's Steve Roby in the photo there. He's the last man who spoke to Fred. Right. Okay. That, that's at Cape Otway where the plaque is, and that's Steve Roby about five, four or five years ago standing there. His wife took that photo, and he's given me permission to to use it, so I put it in the book. He was the guy who was in the tower. He was the guy talking to Fred on the in, yeah in the uh, on the day, speaking to him, asking him what's your what's your height, where are you, can you describe the aircraft, all of that. That was Steve. That's him there. Boy, it's such a heartbreaking case. I can imagine how this must be for the family. Of yeah, there's no no disclose. There's no no closure for the family at all. It's very tragic. I'd love to find the plane. Um, somewhere there were some divers there was a guy who claimed that some divers had found the plane at the bottom of bass strait but it never came to anything they were never able to prove it 
um, no evidence ever ever came of it. So it was just one, another story. But they tried to get thousands of dollars out of the Lentich family to have a look at the photos that they had, supposedly had. But they wanted the payment first. Um, oh, the family just had, had to ignore it. And good on them. That's heartbreaking. You know? well, well, can we bring up a few questions from chat while we still have yeah, time? Yeah. Sure. First, let me just give a shout out to Aussie Jen for the super sticker. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. And Dolly, this one's for you. And this is kind of a blind side, but <laughs> Rick Schatz is asking, Dolly, do you get any psychic impressions of what happened? <laughs> I'm not trying to. I'm completely All staying right. out of it. Okay. All there right. are just some places I won't go, and this is one of them. Okay. I don't blame you for that. Yeah. All right. So here's another interesting comment, which is from Tom. He says In the Unsolved Mysteries episode of Frederick Volentich, they showed mm -hmm. a witness walking along the beach that saw two green UFOs. I seem to remember hearing about other witnesses. Is it, is oh, that, it, was, it, was, it was one green light following the plane. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I suppose you've heard of that, Ben. Yeah, that was just um, as the plane was um, heading towards Cape Hot Way before he turned, he hadn't reported seeing anything yet at that point. So they saw the plane go past and something was following it with a green light. Huh. But Fred didn't, didn't actually report anything until six minutes after he left Cape Hot Way, which was interesting. It was well out to sea when um, when he started saying, oh, do you have anything below 5,000? And right. I said, no, 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 non aircraft. Right, we don't have a whole lot of questions, but there are a couple of mm. more which are kind of interesting. Here's one from Kayleen Gwynmether. She says, I was living in Queensland when this happened in the mainstream media reporting caused an increase in interest in UFOs. What is George's opinion on the interest in UFOs in response to this case? Well, this case got um, international um, response. Well, this story went around the world. Yes, it did. Um, I the, uh, it when it happened. I heard mm, of it when I was younger, yeah, yes. I was 13, so I wasn't even I was, I was, I was 21. So. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, well, the um, the local UFO group here in Melbourne were inundated with international phone calls for about a week mm -hmm. as a result of this going through the news. It was major headlines that that a pilot reported this thing and then disappeared. That's quite unusual. Yeah. Uh, quite yeah, unusual. I don't think there were. Uh, that's something that was like brand new back then. I don't think I heard ever of anything like that. You know, aviation wise. Before that, where a pilot's looking at something in the sky and you don't know what it is, and then poof, they're gone, you know? Yeah. And well, it was a how many other, transmission. Really how strange. many others are there like this? Not many. Yeah. Not, none really quite like this. Yeah. No. All right. Well, here's another question from Pete Penn, which we kind of touched on a little bit. Hmm. Please ask George about the sightings near Pine Gap. Thanks mm -hmm. to you two for being here every Monday. Of course, Pete, we love doing it. And uh, yeah, Pine Gap, I guess, is kind of like Australia's Area 51. Would that be a comparison? It's kind of like that. It's an it's an American base. Oh, P all Pine right. Gap is an it's a top <laughs> secret. It's right. so top secret, nobody's heard of it. Yeah, right? <laughs> they have bases like that all over the world. Just saying, yeah. Yeah, no and so it's an yeah. American base, and um, yeah. that's where where Gordon Liddy said this drone came from. It's a heck of a long way to go from there down to uh, to, yeah. to Murray Bridge to collect a, an aircraft. <laughs> so is there a lot of UFO activity around that particular oh, area? You, you do get quite a lot of sightings come from there. People around that area have um, taken photographs of these unusual things flying in and out of the base, and the photos have been confiscated. Yep. Typically. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, but it's top secret military, so they get away with that. Yep. All right. Yeah. Here's a question which is super easy to. Oops, I lost it naturally. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it is. Fun Talks TV. Was this the first case of UFOs in Australia? 
don't think no, so. no, no, no. They go back <laughs> un, over a hundred years. UFO cases. <laughs> My grandmother had a UFO case. Um, she didn't even call it a UFO. She was out in her backyard one day, sweeping the pathway in her backyard, and she said there was two zeppelins hovering above her backyard, oh. a, a silver one and a gold one. Hmm. Now, there were no airships flying around Melbourne in the mid '60s. This is in the mid nineteen, early to mid nineteen sixties, when this happened to my grandmother. And she, her exact words were, "They must have been cleaning the engines or something." Because a drop of hot oil came out of one and came down and landed on her on her cheek, just below her eye, her left eye. Uh, and she had, she did, I've got photos of her when she was a young lady. She had a mole there. She said, this hot oil landed on the mole, um, and for the rest of her oh life, there was God. no there was no mole there. The mole got burned off. Oh oh and what? And she told me that uh, many years ago, and. She was in her 80s when she was telling me that. She also told me that one day there was a knock at her front door and there were two men in black black suits with black hats standing at the front door. And she said to them, what do you want? She said they pushed the door, forced the door open and didn't answer her. They walked past her and walked right through the house and out into the backyard, which is where she was when this thing, this, this mole had been burned off her face and she went into the backyard to follow them and they t- they had just gone they disappeared they never answered her they just walked through the house and into the backyard they, their car would have been out in the driveway i guess yeah. so they went out to look for something in the backyard and then they left that's insane wow um and that's my grandmother told me that. <laughs> um, yeah. i've got to believe her there's a lot of back engineering going on for a long time, and uh, almost every major uh, country was involved in it and has yep. been France, all everybody, England, Australia, uh, some places in South America. And America uh, has those bases everywhere. And yep. uh, people don't realize how much involved our country mm-hmm. is with all of this worldwide. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's just now starting to be understood that Americans have you know, uh, what's the word, choreographed a lot of the activity. And mm-hmm. Australia, as a matter of fact, is one of those places where they were doing a lot of test flying. I know that. And um, y'all got could to be. see all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in well, communication so just... with a guy from Australia. I'm hoping to talk to him shortly who had a really incredible encounter. Mm-hmm. He says the government has not been helpful at all with this subject. Which no, yeah. it's a crazy big universe, you know. Um, the, the, the guy who runs SETI, um, I've forgotten his name offhand. Stephen Greer? No, no, no. no the guy no, who runs SETI. SETI. Um, oh, the other SETI. Yeah. Okay. The, um, official, the, the official one. Anyway, he was yeah. on TV here saying that uh, we used to think that there was. Um, like one in five of our stars throughout the universe have a planetary system. And then he said, now we think it's one in three. And that was years ago. Uh, it's probably, I think by now they've considered that every star in the solar system has planets. Yes, right. Absolutely, and there's, yeah. there's so many possibilities of there being life, just like planets like ours. And why wouldn't they come here? You know, exactly. No. All right, I got a couple of more questions, and one yeah. is kind of a tangent. It's kind of off topic, but we always say any questions okay. Yeah. So yeah. I will pull it up. It's from Sharon, and she's asking: Has any experiencer, including yourselves, ever verified the Ivan 013 videos, aka Skinny Bob? I've looked at them. I'm skeptic. I think the Skinny Bob is probably just I don't know CGI. How could we tell if it's real or not? But as far as I know. I don't know anyone who's been able to verify that it's real. You know the skinny dog videos? Yeah, it's it's consistent with what people report. People who have had these abduction experiences report these skinny guys. I I knew a lady who um unfortunately died just a couple of years ago um, after COVID, but um, she died of cancer just a couple of years ago. Lovely lady, and she was an experiencer for many years. Used to go to the groups that I used to go to. 
um, she said that the main one, there was like a group of these guys who come and take her away and bring her back again. And the main one was a very, very skinny one. She just called it the the lanky one, I think she called it. The long, tall, lanky, skinny yeah. one. Which I'm is sure consistent there are photos out there which consistent with the skinny bob, you know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. We, I just we don't, I don't think we really have enough knowledge to say if somebody knows if it's real or not, but I'm sure yeah. our governments have all kinds of photographs. Well, okay. it seems like somebody or something has been playing with the human genome for many years. There's a lot of weird things going on nowadays that didn't happen in our grandparents' day. I'm telling you. Right. I don't know. My great, I have a great grandmother who is from Sweden, Sparia, and mm. uh, she told me she saw uh, UFOs. Um, she didn't call them that either. She just called them craft which I find funny because that's how I refer to them now. And uh, she said on multiple occasions up in the, she was a Same Laplander and, uh, mm -hmm. and as a small young girl. And uh, they just took it in stride and went, oh, look, you know, there they are. And this yeah. was in the 1800s. So, right. 1800s, so. All right. Well, I've got one more quick question and kind of already covered this. This is towards you, Dolly. With your experience as a contactee, is it possible a collision like this might be possible? Shouldn't there be a productive bubble or something? Fun Talks is asking. It's Basically, impossible. I already said no. <laughs> so, yeah, no. Yeah. no. Craft have two fields, one inner field and one outer field. The inner field takes care of the craft itself, and the outer field protects the craft from anything coming at it. It also helps them skiff on the magnetic field lines. Um, not, it would repel anything it can at it, even a bullet. Nothing can penetrate that field. It's high, high graviton energy surrounding it in plasma. There's no way. So I'm, I'm erring on the side of that craft was a some sort of drone. It may have been remotely operated. That's why it happened, because the operator wasn't fast enough to avoid the collision. And if the plane stuck to it, they, it probably would have landed right away, ergo going into the field to try to help the guy in the plane to see if they killed him. And then uh, then it would have tried to get out of there and go away. If it, Especially if it was military, they needed to clean that up and get it gone as quickly as possible. Well, I did a chapter in one of my books about UFO collisions. There's some with cars. And, yeah. you know, Because the Pentagon is saying, oh, these UFOs are flying around. It's dangerous. There could be a collision. There's been near misses. And I mm. found... Mi Almost none. There was one case in yeah. over Mexico City, I think, where three UFOs came and basically lifted a small plane <laughs> and carried it a short distance. Yeah, they probably mm. they probably EMP'd it by accident and held it stasis till they could get it to somewhere safe. They won't let anybody die on purpose. They're weird about that. Um, you can't you can't get too close to any uh, a craft either if its emitters are facing you. It'll knock all your electrical systems out in a second. And mm -hmm. uh, if that would explain why they grabbed him and blew him off. So. You know about the Knowles case? Yes, Faye Knowles. And yeah, Sean. the car got lift, lifted up off the road. And That's right. There's, a, yep. there's actually a, a cinema movie film being made about it at the moment. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll be yeah. first line to watch that one. So we've covered the, the case pretty good. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Because I'm also interested in your investigations that you've done with other cases. Right, right. Um, it's usually the same the same sort of thing. People report what they've seen, nobody believes them, and then it turns out it's on the news, other people saw it too, and so they're verified, you know, things like that. So you, you haven't had any you know. up-close encounters reported to you? Oh, I knew this lady I spoke about before, this lady whose name was Diane, who um, she was actually, um, she had her first encounter in Italy when she was a teenager and she, the family moved out to Australia and then these things um, started visiting her. Uh, she she thought they were ghosts visiting her house <laughs> um, because they came through the walls. They yes. just flooded in through the walls. She thought they were ghosts. Yeah. One day she had... Um, the TV on in the background with the sound down and she was in her kitchen doing something. And, and then she saw these things that looked like the ghosts. And it was a documentary on, on Bud Hopkins showing that his artists had done drawings of these creatures that looked like the cover of communion. 
you know. Yeah. Um, wow. And that they'd come in through the walls. And she said, hey, that's, they're my ghosts. So she watched the show. But that's how she discovered there were aliens visiting her. She thought they were ghosts. So that's a very oh, yeah. interesting case. And uh, her name was Diane Karachi. Um, but she's no longer with us, unfortunately. She wouldn't have gone on a show to talk about it either. She wouldn't even rarely go to meetings. She didn't want to sort of be ridiculed by anybody. But she had these things going on in her life here in Australia. Wow. So moving from Italy to Australia had no effect. She couldn't get away from them by moving to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> I'll that. It's, it's uh, a worldwide phenomenon, yeah. Well, That's, in Australia now, are people talking about UFOs, UAPs more now? Is it more accepted in your opinion? Or? Oh, look, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, the public have changed their view. They're not, not as sceptical as they used to be because of uh, the 2017 admission from the U.S. Navy that they actually have a clandestine um, study group of UAP, although they're trying to backpedal right now. Um, they did admit that they, they study UFOs and take them seriously because they're flying around up there and they're encountering them. They are a, a real phenomenon. So uh, I, if I wear my, my jacket that's got Australian UFO research written on the back, if I take public transport, people will come up to me and say, "Look, that, is, is that real? Is that really real?" They don't. They don't criticize or laugh anymore. They actually ask me the serious question: "Is there something to it?" And I say, "Yeah, there sure is." So the oh. the attitude has changed in the public eye. They they're a lot more willing to look at. Uh, it's it's not, you know, it's not the tin foil hat brigade. You know, it's yeah, right. something really really true going on. Um, they, you know, they're starting to think like that, which is probably why right now um, the authorities there in the, in the States are trying to backpedal so hard. But the cat's out of the bag, you know. They, goodness. Everybody, everybody knows now that this is a real phenomenon. Well, the, the Lentich yeah. case is easily, I think, Australia's most famous case. But you're from Melbourne, and that's right where the Westall case happened, which is... Probably Australia is also <laughs> very close. It's, did you ever, I mean, did you have any memory of when that happened? That was 66, well, right? You would have been pretty young. I was in, uh, I think, grade one or two in primary school that year, grade two. And uh, I remember not hearing nothing about it except there was a thing on the news one night on the news. And there was these oh. two girls being interviewed and the interview got cut off mid-sentence. Somebody wow. off camera said, nope, this interview is over. And that went to air. And that, that's the footage that nobody can find nowadays. That footage has gone missing. That's in the in the Westall documentary they talk about. They tried to find the Channel 9 footage. I saw that live to air when they showed it in 1966. Wow. That footage, yeah. So the students were being interviewed and they were, they were told to shut up live on camera. Um and that was Joy Clark was one of those two girls in that interview. Now, I tried to find these UFO witnesses for years and eventually um, I went to a couple of the school reunions and met them all and uh, I know a lot of those witnesses and uh, they're, they're all our age. We're all the, roughly the same age and they were in high school or primary school when that happened. And, um, you know, that every time they have a school reunion, all they talk about is the flying the day they saw the flying saucer. Wow. Now, people say, oh, no, it was just a weather balloon. Well, if I saw, see a weather balloon, I'm not going to be thinking about it in 50 years' time. <laughs> right. It's just a weather balloon. Right. You know? These people saw this thing that was unusual and it performed. What Joy says, when it left, it was sitting there and it turned side on like this mm -hmm. and then just shot straight up. In yep. a split second, it was in space. When she described mm -hmm. that, I knew it was real because so many witnesses I've talked to describe how the craft will lift up, turn sideways, and off they go. And right. you're gone in a split second. Right. I've got a really good case that I investigated myself personally, um, which hasn't really been published very much at all, maybe in one of our magazines over here. Um, <clears throat> it was a guy who was writing, he, a guy called Laurie was writing his memoirs in his 70s this is about 20 years ago now and um he said he he was going to include this ufo sighting he had in his memoirs 
then he realized he'd never actually reported it. So he reported it to the Australian UFO Research Network, and it came to me because it was a Victorian case. And I rang him up and spoke to him on the phone, and it was a great case. He was saying goodbye to his friend. Um, he lived, you know, but he was in a place in Brunswick in, in Melbourne, right. and uh, he was just um, riding home on his bike, and it was just getting dark. And he felt he thought he must have had a flat tire because there was this vibration coming through his bike. And he actually stopped the bike and got off and checked the tires if they weren't flat. Hmm. And thought that's strange. And he got back on the bike and started riding again. This vibration thing started again. And he said it was like, you know, when um when the school bus is sitting there waiting and the engines are just running, but they're not going anywhere, the, the diesels are idling, the sides of the bus can just start vibrating because of the rumbling of the motor and you get a resonation in the, and it vibrates. That was the sort of thing he was detecting while he was riding his bike. The next thing that went through his mind was he thought a truck or a car or a bus or something was about to run him over because they didn't have their lights on. He couldn't see any lights. But that was the same vibration as what comes from a truck or a bus or something. And he looked around. There was no other traffic on the road. And then he looked up and there was this thing hovering above the rooftops and he stopped the bike and this thing was just hovering above the rooftops. And this is in the early, about 1952, 1953, he said this happened, so before my time. And um, <clears throat> he said that um, as he watched it and he could feel the vibration coming from this thing, he said it had windows and it was windows at one end and it was glowing at the other end. And it was like a cigar-shaped thing just hovering over the roofs, just going across the suburbs slowly, M much like that huge wing in that um, that Arizona case. Anyway, yeah. he, he was right. just sitting yeah, there like... and, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, and uh, he's looking at this thing mm -hmm. and uh, it's just sitting there. And he said if he blinked, he would have missed it. In a yeah. split second, in a split second, it went from just over the houses it was up in space in orbit in a split second and there was no sonic boom, no wind noise, nothing, and he was glad he hadn't blinked or he would have missed it. <laughs> I, asked him, I asked him how big was this thing. He said, well, do you know the Russian Antonov cargo plane? I said, yes. He said, well, it was three times bigger than one of those, <laughs> three times the size of an Antonov. This thing was massive. 250 and was, feet. And in a blink, it was gone. Yeah. yeah. Makes you wonder how many people are inside that thing or ETs. Well, <laughs> you know? he, turned, he turned around and went back to his, to his friend who just left. Um, he'd gone. He's going home for tea. It was dark, you know. Uh, and he went back to see his friend. His friend hadn't gone inside yet. His friend was just staring at the sky with his mouth open. Yeah, he probably saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, really good case. Well, that is a good you might have to write another book, George. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Duchess no. wants to be on the show. She always comes right before we go. Oh, what, what, what kind of a dog have you got there? She's a great Dane. Yeah. <laughs> 135 great pounds of Great Dane. Yes. Wow. Long legs. Beautiful. Oh my God. Beautiful. There she goes. It's time for Look, her to go outside. <laughs> thank you for thank you for giving me so much time, so much um time on this case here to spend with you talking about this it's uh it's a case that's really i was thinking about it for 40 years before i wrote the book so wow. i wonder uh, did the family time. ever consider seeing a medium or a psychic to get information that way yeah i don't i i'm not sure about that i think they were quite skeptical of that sort of stuff i think right. yeah either the plane or some trace of this missing boy you know Gosh, he's out there somewhere. I mean, either yeah. if he's passed on or not, something happened. Yeah, we just we just don't know. We still don't know. That's amazing. Yeah, I sure do hope one day we do. That would be amazing. Yeah, it's an enduring mystery. It but sure is. Not so. It's amazing to me that you're the one who's telling the story with all the the the, the symmetry of the story itself in your your two degrees of separation from everybody. That's incredible. It's like you were you were in the right place at the right time to be the one to bring the story out, you know? And it yeah, seems to me like you've done a really good job of, you know, 
researching it. That's it's, amazing. It's like it's like it's my it's my life's mission is to um, get the story out. <laughs> but I look at it as this: people, a lot of pilots, especially, like to attack Fred and say he was a bad pilot and he didn't know what he was no. doing and it was his fault. Uh, I just have to go and defend him. It's all right. I, I just feel like Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. always going into bat for Fred, you know, because they can say whatever they like when he's not around, you know. It's really quite cowardly of them, I think, you know. Yeah. Well, he did the right thing. He started circling. Instead of going further out into the water, he was circling. He stayed in place. He was yeah, spotting yeah. it. He was talking yeah. calmly on the radio to them. He was doing every responsible thing he could do. That's not a bad pilot. Not at all. Yeah. He was a very courageous pilot, as a matter of fact. So, and his plan was to continue on to King Island, which he tried to do. And he didn't get there. Well, I have to encourage everyone to check out the book because it's getting great ratings, absolutely um, reviews on Amazon, mm -hmm. which is pretty Very unusual because a lot of books don't get such good reviews. But definitely, the readers are loving the book. So that's great. That's definitely great. check it out. Um, all yeah, getting. I mean, these are all library in your library. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. like a reference. That's awesome. Yeah, it's an you're important case. Things that I didn't know. I've only heard little bits of information from this story. I remember when it happened. I remember registering it in my brain and thinking, wow, this is really interesting. But I didn't hear any more than a pilot disappeared with a plane, blah, blah, blah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So no, it's a very interesting case. Do you guys know about reverse speech? I do. I'm not sure I'm a believer in it, but I've certainly heard of it. Well, I went to a barbecue once and somebody wanted to try out a reverse speech tape recorder and they said they had handed me the mic and said, here, say something. And, and I spoke into the mic and I just said, look, I just went to a UFO conference, had a great time. I told them about cases in Victoria and uh, they hadn't heard of them and had a really good time. As I was saying that, another thought went through my mind, but I didn't say it. I just it, A thought went through my mind, which was, I thought I would be nervous because I was giving this talk to you to strangers interstate. And they played the tape backwards and there was a lot of gobbledygook and then everybody who was at the barbecue heard me saying on the tape when it was played backwards, I thought I would be nervous. Yeah. Right? That's and I was, you transmitted I was, it to magnetic <laughs> tape. You, you I, actually did it there. It was on a tape. Now, I was shocked because yeah. I knew I had just had that thought but I didn't speak it. I was right. saying something else at the time, but when right. they played the tape backwards, it came out as I thought I would be nervous. Which way it went on. So that's very, very cool. Yeah. To me, to me, that yeah. was a demonstration that this stuff works. Now yes, it does. This oh, this, right. Valente, this tape where the farmer is talking about this craft and he he talks about the farmer coming into his shop but he doesn't say the guy's name. Ten years ago, I figured I should reverse that bit because oh. he's, he's, that's when the thought of the guy's name is going to go through his mind, And but he hasn't said it. It's not on the tape. So I reversed that part of the tape and a name popped straight up. <laughs> right? A clear name popped up. Now, the son of the, the guy who was in the recording who's telling the story is no longer alive. But I'm in contact with his son, and just early or last middle of last year, I contacted his son and I said, "Look, it sounds like your dad said when I played a bit of the tape back. It sounded like your dad said the name Ian Bryson." He said, "Oh, he was a he was a farmer. He was a friend of my dad's. Um, our kids played together, and uh, I even bought a car off him. I think he's the guy you're looking for." So I got oh, the name God. confirmed. Yeah, that I, I only got the name by reversing this tape, right. and I've had I've got confirmation of the farmer's name. Right, right. The possibility is that's, very weird. That's it's not in. Right. That's not in the book because I yeah. I've had to write an extra chapter which I now have to add to the book yeah. which goes into this reverse tape. Right. Well, we're at the end of we're running out of time. We've got a couple of yeah. minutes. Two you minutes. Know, you want to give out any information? We've got your. Facebook link in the uh, mm -hmm. show notes if anyone wants to reach out to you. 
Yeah, okay. sure. Right. Um, I'm happy to talk to people uh, and discuss the case or anyone who's read the book. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions they might have if they've read the book. Uh, yeah, no Very problems. Cool. It's all open. Well, but I do have much. to. I have to add another chapter to the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I would put that in, the reverse tape thing. I would put that in. That's in incredible. I and mean, it's like confirmation, you know. Sometimes when I have psychic impressions on things or I see things, I don't take them at face value right away. I wait for confirmation. And uh, yeah. like the other day, I can't tell you the whole story what was going on, but I had somebody visit me. And then I find out from two different places who managed to call me that day and, yeah. and ask me, uh, what's going on and why is this? And I'm asking, what do you mean? And they confirmed the visitation from the person. Right. And I was like, well, right. okay, well, then yeah. it's really happened, yeah. you know? So, yeah. Well, we do have to say goodbye, or otherwise we're going to not finish right. the archives. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, George. Yes, thank no you very worries. much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, for having listening. me. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thank you, everyone in chat who donated yeah. and um, just came to hear our guest tonight. Kim King says, need this book. Yes, you do. Yep. Amazon. Okay. That's a great All mystery. Right. Congratulations on the yes. book. George is a great storyteller. George is such a great speaker. Yeah, people in chat are absolutely loving you. So thank you, thank absolutely. you so much. Thank Peace. you very much. <laughs> Peace. Hey, everybody. This is the uh, our edition tonight of The Light Gate. We uh, love the fact that you show up and, and you help us. And we like to bring you good content. And tonight was really good content. Uh, we're coming to you live from the beautiful city of New Orleans, in Louisiana, at the United um, United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. I want you all to have a wonderful week. Namaste. Love everybody. Good night. <laughs>